Hi, I'm Gail Bowen, and I am the author of the uh, Joanne Kilborn Shreve Mystery Series. As all of you know, we are living in a time of upended plans and, and quick replans, and I am part of one of the quick replans, and, and very happy to be doing this. Um, I'm going to be reading today from The Unlocking Season, which is the 19th novel in the Joanne Kilborn series. And uh, now it was pub it's published on, it will be published on September 1st. Normally, and uh, the weeks before, uh, the weeks before and after the publication of a book are very, very busy and there's all kinds of stuff going on. And it, and it starts early because the catalogs are usually out about five months ahead of time. And at that point that it goes to, uh, uh, then the, they're, they're sent to booksellers and festivals and all these people. And then the publicist comes to me and says, tell me what your ideal book tour would be. And then, then they take that my ideal book tour and then with, within bounds of common sense and, and money, they... They plan it so that it's a very it, it takes a long time and and uh, but we you know we get it done and so this year and as I said a busy time this year of course there's none of that and everyone's trying to scramble a little bit I think and uh, but I think that really I mean we I, I my husband and I talk about this we have had really the best time for it we for the first 18 books we have traveled and and uh I don't like flying, so we have we actually Canada. We've been across Canada on Via thirty times, which is kind of amazing. But you know, you think about all the things that we really have had a chance to do. We've had, I mean, obviously we have been well. We've been at all the big festivals, and there, which are a colossal waste of money in my opinion, but are great because you get to stay at an amazing hotel and uh, get great food and free li free liquor and uh, and you usually <laughs> usually read for half an hour so that and they give you six days of this uh, harbor front you know anyway um but but anyway we've had all that wonderful that wonderful stuff and um but uh i have also i guess more seriously i've gotten to read with writers whom i'd long admired and and that was a thrill and also to see new writers who are coming up and then kind of watching you know their careers as they went on, and so that part has been lovely. And uh, um, anyway, so that's that's one of the nice things. But I think one of the other nice things this kind of draws me closer to what I'm doing today, and that is the chance to go to so many libraries. And uh, I have loved libraries since I was uh, five years old. And my grandmother took me to Earl's Court Public Library in Toronto, and. Uh, and it was uh, on a Saturday morning, and she always, after that, for all the time I was a kid, I was there. But uh, she would, in those days, the, there was a children's library on one side of the library, and the other side was adults. And it was a much more innocent time. So my grandmother just dropped me off on the children's side, picked me up, you know, about three hours later, and I was fine. She was fine. And uh, so, I mean, there was that. So there always have been libraries in my life. And... And I think three of them, uh, at, at three points in my life, libraries have been the center of my life. And that was, I was writer in residence at uh, Toronto Reference Library. And I've been writer in residence at Calgary Memorial Library. And then here in Regina. And uh, they all had, they were all great lessons and wonderful. You know, just they were unique and, and uh, but they were all just really terrific experiences. My, when I was at Toronto Reference Library, they have the huge Conan Doyle collection, and it's the definitive one. And so my office was a replica of, exact replica of Conan Doyle's. I had to lock it, you know, whenever I, I went to the bathroom, I think there were like first edition books in there. And it was, it was really stunning. And they had, a, they had a, I mean, everything. They had apparently, they had started, I became friends with the librarian who was in charge of this. And at the beginning, they had a hypodermic needle uh, out because, of course, he was, <laughs> that was a part of his life. And uh, it lasted half a day. So that was, that was one thing that went. But, um, but they did have, they did have the pipes that were out there. And there was a, there was a briar wood and uh, clay. And then there was cherry wood. And the clay one was his favorite. And they were right in a, in a little, um, kind of a, just a little uh, drawer, very close to me, glass on top. 
And I kept looking at them thinking, oh, I wonder, maybe I should do that. But I was never brave enough to do that. So, But what struck me is that regardless of, uh, you know, I've been, you know, all over Canada to li libraries, obviously, of very di varying sizes. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, and the customers or the, the patrons are very different. And, uh, but whatever the librarians are, they take a, a close look at their patrons and they uh, assess their needs and then they could just move heaven and earth to meet those needs. And so, and I'm this, uh, so this now brings me to what I'm doing today because normally um, it, uh, in October here in Saskatchewan, we have Saskatchewan Library Week. And uh, many writers, including me, uh, are invited to go to a library this year. I was supposed to go to Indian Head. And of course, that, uh, that COVID put a, uh, put a dent in that. And so what the Saskatchewan Library Association has done is they've done some, a very quick and smart thing, which is that they have had, they, they will have a, a number of us will be doing what I'm doing right now, which is talking about a reading from a, a book that I've just written re recently blah, and uh, also but uh, and talking a little bit about the just about the book and about uh, and as I said at the end of this I think what I'm going to do is ask the questions that if I were in a real library people would ask me but I'm not going to ask any of the really hard ones <laughs> so there I'll just ask myself nice questions Anyway, so, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, the plans have been changed, and, uh, and so um, here is what we're doing, and, and then I'm going to now uh, start to move over and read my, uh, read from the book. And this is the book, this is, I still, I have a whole box of gorgeous new real books out there. This is an advanced copy, and I don't know why, I, I, I just got used to reading from this one, that's it, and age, age likes the old familiars, I guess. Anyway, this is um, The Unlocking Season, and as I said, it's the 19th novel. The passage I'll be reading from comes midway through the, uh, through the novel, and uh, a production company um, is producing a six-part TV series called Sisters and Strangers about the tangled relationships between the family of Douglas Allard, who Joanne has always believed was her biological father, and the family of Desmond Love, the father of Joanne's best friend, Sally, and the man uh, uh, who Joanne has just very recently learned uh, is her own biological father. She, Joanne has been working closely with Georgie Shepard, the writer on the Sisters and Strangers script. And uh, in this scene, I'm, uh, it, I'm about to, the scene I'm about to read, Joanne attends the first table meeting of the production team of Sisters and Strangers. And I've been to table meetings and it's it's the most exciting and most creative part of anything you'll ever do because everyone has been working. It's when all the people who've been working on the series come together for the first time. So actors, writers, costume designers, design, you know, lighting director, the musical director, locations manager, everyone uh, will come and it's like show and tell. Everyone brings what they've been doing and all of us, because all of us work alone. I mean, the writers work alone and and all of a sudden, it's you're all sitting around at a table, and it starts to come to life. It is very exciting. The table meeting was being held at the Living Skies office in what was called accurately, if unimaginatively, the big room. Georgie was waiting for me inside the building when I arrived. Standing beside her was a broad-shouldered, imposing man with obsidian eyes, a mellow brown complexion, a shaved head, and a captivating smile. Georgie introduced to Miss Hal Dupree, the costume designer for Sisters and Strangers, and when Hal's large, strong hand enclosed mine, I felt the warmth of connection. You're Miss Allard, he said. Thank you for sharing the home movies Ben Bendure made of your family's life. They've been an inspiration. Please call me Joanne, I said, and it's Joanne Shreve. I haven't been an alert for almost four decades. He bowed. I apologize. Hal Dupuis' voice was low and sonorous, and he spoke with the precision of a man who treasured language. I didn't know about your marriage. We've only been given the films of the years between your birth and your 16th birthday. A frisson of apprehension rippled through me. 
I didn't realize those movies had been circulated. Then I must apologize again, Hal said. But please know, those home movies have been invaluable, not just to me and my colleagues at makeup and wardrobe, but to the production designer, the locations manager, the set construction coordinator, the music producer, the food stylist, everybody. I was overwhelmed. Suddenly it seemed that like Alice, I'd stumbled headfirst into the rabbit hole. There's a food stylist? Hal Dupuis' hearty laugh seemed to come from somewhere deep within. Oh yes, he said, and he has had far too much fun learning how to make candied violets the way Nina Love did. Hal cut my elbow in one of his large hands. Let's go in and meet everyone. Once you see the ways in which we've used what you've given us, perhaps you'll forgive us for being intrusive. There were perhaps 25 people at the meeting. Except for Nick Kovacs, who greeted me with a hug, and Ainsley, Georgie, and Fawn Tatusis, I knew no one. But as Hell guided me around, making the introductions, everyone was cordial and commented on how helpful Ben Bendure's home movies had been to their preparations. Ainsley was at the head of the table, and when she spotted us, she gestured to the three empty places to her right, and Georgie, Hal, and I settled in. I should have told you about the movies being circulated, Georgie said. Don't worry about it, I said. They've obviously served a purpose. Georgie tented her fingers and looked at them thoughtfully. There's something else, Joanne. Because of the movies, everyone at this table feels intimately connected with your family and Sally's. But for us, you're all characters to be dressed or lighted or moved in and out of a scene. No one will be intentionally insensitive, but... Ainsley cut her off. I'll handle it, Georgie. She was very pale, and the circles beneath her eyes seemed to have darkened with every sleepless night. Ainsley was 44, Roy's age. The night they danced so blissfully to begin the begin. It seemed they were two people whom age would never touch. But they had been mortal after all. Now, five months later, Roy was dead and Ainsley was suddenly old. As soon as she turned to face the group, the chatter stopped and the room became quiet. Before we begin, she said, I'd like to welcome Joanne Ellard Shreve to the table and ask everyone to remember that the characters we we're dealing with were people Joanne knew and loved. I know you will show them and Joanne the respect they deserve. She turned to the series producer. Now, Fawn, we'll get us started. I had only met Fawn Tatusis on a few occasions, but each time I'd been impressed by her quiet intelligence and her composure. She'd spent years in the film industry and had learned the importance of watching and listening from the elder, elders at Poundmaker Cree Nation near Cutknife, Saskatchewan. Gabe Vickers' sudden death had rocked the lives of everyone in his orbit. It also raised serious questions about the fate of his company, Living Skies Productions, and about the future of the company's major project, Sisters and Strangers. But whatever else he was, Gabe Vickers was a dyna dynamic executive producer, and he left what would turn out to be his final project in great shape. The financing for Sisters and Strangers was in place. Two of the principal actors had been signed, and negotiations with Gabe's first choices for the other five principal roles were in final stages. The heads of all the departments had been chosen and the series director and writer were already at work. Everything was where it had to be, but time was not on the side of Sisters and Strangers. Rosamund Burke would be 81 when shooting was scheduled to begin. She was in good health, but as Rosamund herself pointed out, 12-hour working days could be taxing for an actor who was no longer an ingenue. At 18, Vale Frazier was still able to pass as Sally at 14, a girl on the cusp of becoming a woman. That delicate balance was critical in the early episodes of the series, but if the project were delayed, 
Vale would almost certainly outgrow the part. Fawn looked around the room and said, well, we're all here, and then heads turned as Kyle Daly burst into the room, apologized for being late, looked desperately around the table for a vacant chair, and then having located one, collapsed into it. Fawn gave him a forgiving, we've all been there smile, and waited until he settled in before she spoke. Fawn's long-fingered hands were graceful and expressive, as essential to communicating her thoughts as her words. As she began again, she held out her hands, palms up, in a gesture of inclusion. We are all missing Roy today, she said. This past week has been difficult for us, and we are still reeling. But ready or not, we must move on. Roy once told me that when he was hurting, his work took him out of himself. Remembering Roy's words, let's get to work and hope for the best. This is primarily a creative meeting, so this is the time for me to step back, listen, and take notes. I have met with you individually, and each of you has identified your department's needs and flagged possible bumps in the road. I'll be meeting regularly with heads of departments, but if you discover you need special equipment, run into an unexpected expense, or face a problem with time, Please let me know as soon as possible. I'll end by saying what I always say. No path is without obstacle. They are as frustrating as they are inevitable. But often the way you overcome the obstacle opens a new creative path. So hang in there. Try the options. Talk them out. And if nothing works, remember we're all in this together. Everyone working on this project has the same goal. We all want to make something incredible. We are co-creators. We've got you covered. You are safe. Fawn turned to Ainsley. Ready to say a few words? When Ainsley shook her head, Georgie shot her a worried look and then picked up the cue. Fawn's right about the path being with no path being without obstacles, Georgie said. At first, Roy's death seemed to be an obstacle that was insurmountable. But now we know that he left us the blueprints and the tools to find our way without him. The scripts for the first two episodes are locked, and you've all read them. You know that Roy has already created the landscapes, physical and emotional, for the series. And that in Sisters and Strangers, he has given us complex nuanced characters with beating hearts. There are points of real drama in these scripts, times when big things happen, but mostly what we are doing is inviting the audience into our characters' lives, showing in detail the moments that shaped the women Sally Love and Joanne Allard became, sisters who were strangers for much of their lives, but who were joined by a bond that even death couldn't sever. Together, Joanne and I have completed the episode that Roy began, but never finished. The writing needs to be polished, but we found our path, and we know where we're going. Stay tuned. Hal Dupuy leaned toward me and whispered, That is such a relief. We've all been on tender hooks. He slid a drawing out of his art portfolio, laid it face down on the table, and stood to address the gathering. I've only begun, but I already know that dressing the women in this series will be a joy, he said. All those stunning outfits of the early 60s. And of course, Nina Love was a goddess, in her own mind at least. And he looked toward me. And of course, to you, Joanne. I was dumbfounded. Until that moment, I hadn't known how Dupuis existed. And yet he knew about the darkest love I had ever experienced. When he saw my expression, Hal looked crestfallen. And I've blundered again, he said. Let me try to explain. We were all given what Roy Brodnitz had written, the scripts and his notes. Roy's writing is sublime, but I couldn't grasp the complexity of Nina Love's character from words on a page. I needed more. When I saw Nina in Ben Bendura's movies, I began to understand her, her love for beauty, 
her narcissism, her obsessive need for control, and her charm as she manipulated those around her. In the presentation folders in front of you, you'll find a drawing of the gown Nina will wear the first time she appears on screen. Hellbent turned over the drawing that had been face down on the table and slid it toward me. I think you'll recognize this, he said quietly. The drawing took my breath away. In every detail, it was the dress Nina had worn at the first grown-up dinner party I'd ever attended. That evening, our island seemed enchanted. The lake was calm, the moon full, the night starry, and fairy lights had been strung through the branches of the willows. The air smelled of nicotinia, expensive perfumes, and cigarette smoke. The men were all handsome, and the women were all lovely, but none was lovelier than Nina, in a dress whose clean lines showcased her graceful arms, her elegant neck, and her exquisite heart-shaped face. She had worn her dark hair in a chignon that night, and when she leaned forward to chat with her guests, her pearl and diamond drop earrings glowed as they touched her cheeks. A sample of the material we're using for the dress is attached to your drawings, Hal said. The piece of vibrant blue silk Hal Dupuy gave me was larger than the swatches of material stapled to the drawings. Nina had taught me how to tell true silk from fake. She said that when you hold true silk, it will lay across your hand as naturally as a second skin. As I looked at the graceful drape of the silk in my hand, I swallowed hard, remembering. Beside me, Hal relaxed as appreciative nods and murmurs of approbation met his design. Every time I start a new project, I remember Helen Mirren saying she wept the first time she had a costume fitting for the queen and saw the clothes and shoes she would have to play to wear, play as she wore, as she played Elizabeth II. Mirren said, I can't play anyone who'd wear those clothes. Then she began researching, and she understood that the queen dresses as she does because she's uninterested in clothes, and she doesn't care what she looks like as long as it's the right thing for the right moment. When Mirren began donning the clothes that the costume department made for her, she was thrilled about how the clothes, all lined with incredibly expensive silk, felt, and about how she felt when she wore them. Marin said that only when she put on the clothing of the queen did she begin to understand what it was like to be the queen. I believe that when the actor playing Nina Love puts on this dress, she'll understand what it was like to be a woman with the beauty, power, and ruthlessness to twist the lives of others until they gave her what she wanted. Hell paused. That's it for me. I have a score of other designs, but they're not in their final form. Hal took his seat and turned to me. Did I pass the test? Oh, yes, I said, you passed the test. Wherever did you find Prussian blue silk? Hal's expression was rueful. Online, he said, these days the world is our oyster. Now tell me, how did you come to know the name of that particular shade? Nina told me, I said, The dye is made from cyanide salts, but it isn't toxic because it's bound to something else. Iron, Hal said. It's a tight bond that renders the cyanide harmless. Unlike Nina, I said. The communal show and tell continued. The locations manager, Edie Gunn, a deeply tanned athletic woman with a steel gray Dutch bob and a no-nonsense attitude, asked us to turn on our tablets. She posted photos of Ernest Linder's cabin and of the virgin forest that surrounded it. At Kyle Daly's request, she too had taken a number of photos of forest undergrowth, fallen branches, lichen, and tree bark. Edie said Kyle believed the photos would help determine the design style for sets, locations, graphics, and even camera angles. I didn't see the point in it myself, Edie added, but I'm a team player. 
The distance between Regina and Emmon Lake was 415 kilometers, but Edie said the lake surrounding the island was as pristine and undeveloped as an Ontario lake in the early 1960s would have been, and she felt the authenticity was worth the expense. She suggested that the production company shoot exteriors in northern Saskatchewan for three weeks in summer and two weeks in autumn and have the the cabin's interiors built in the production studios. Edie Gunn had other news. The Mackenzie Art Gallery in Regina had given the go-ahead to film there for a few days between exhibitions. However, Sally Love's notorious fresco erotobiography would have to be recreated on set. The Mackenzie had been polite but firm in refusing to have a fresco of the sexual parts of the 100 individuals with whom Sally Love had been intimate, painted directly on one of its gallery walls. Everyone chatted quietly as they checked out their tablets, but Ainsley, who had not opened hers, remained silent. The reports continued. Nick Kovacs discussed Roy's desire to use as much natural light as possible in shooting and said that when Ainsley was ready, they would go through the locked scripts together, marking scenes where the use of natural life would be feasible. Sketches of sets were passed around and discussion broke out about whether music would be used to foster a mood, evoke the era, or as a Greek chorus with lyrics commenting on the story. The room hummed with the energy of professionals beginning a new venture together, but Ainsley remained expressionless, isolated by grief. After the last person in the circle had reported, Fawn thanked everyone and turned to Ainsley. Anything you'd like to say before we go our separate ways? Ainsley picked up her satchel. I have nothing, she said. And she left the room, her bleak statement hanging in the air like a pall. Hal Dupuis was a heavy man with a face made for smiling. But as he watched Ainsley leave, his features had a bloodhound droop. That poor soul, he said. This was a misery for her, but Joanne... Your morning mustn't end on a sad note. It's, it's okay, I said hastily. No, today was your first meeting with the people who are going to bring your story to life. It's always a special moment and it should be celebrated, Hal said. Roy told me once that when he was writing, he always needed a talisman, an object that connected him with the story he was telling. Hal handed me the swatch of Prussian blue silk. Take this. It's a souvenir of your first table meeting. I was watching your face when you saw my design for Nina's dress. I suspect there might be unfinished business there. Having this piece of Prussian blue silk close by may help you finish it. And now (laughs) we have some questions. And these are questions that I made up. And I think, as I said, I think that they are... um, uh, they're kind of all in, in, a, in a cluster. But these are the questions I guess I get asked most. And one was, did you expect the series to go on this long? And the answer is no. Deadly Appearances was uh, published in 1990. So this is 30 years for Joanne and me. And the other thing, the question, it's, it's flattering, is what does major series endure? And I wish that I could say that I made I, uh, that I made these very thoughtful decisions at the beginning. But in fact, they were simply lucky. One was the decision to make Joanne Kilborn much like the women I knew, uh, middle aged with children and dogs and friends, and um, and whom she loves, and a genuine commitment to J. S. Woodsworth's belief that what we desire for ourselves, we wish for others. So. She, so we take our place, as, as Woodward said, in the world struggles. And Joanne, for all of all of the fact that she is a, a you know a very nice middle class woman in a, in a middle class area, is very committed to social justice and to and to just simply righting wrongs. And in that, also, she's like many many women I know, many people I know, but uh, but certainly women who uh, don't consider themselves heroes or anything, but. If they see something that's wrong, they just roll up their sleeves and say, well, let's take this on. 
anyway, and because Joanne ages, her children grow up. And at the beginning, Mika was just in, in Deadly Appearances. Mika was just starting university. Um, she didn't. She didn't stay. And my daughter says she wanted to quit. Mika wanted to quit university. And my daughter, my real daughter, Hildy says, people often will say, "Is that your real family?" And Hildy says, "Just read about when Mika quit university." And her mother said, "Oh well." She said to me, you know, you would have had your your teeth sunk in my ankle and said, no, no. So anyway, Mika's uh, wanted to quit. She quits university in first year and, become, and becomes very successful as a caterer. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, her, and Peter is still in high school, her brother. And then the younger brother is eight years younger, as our Nathaniel is in our family, and he's still in public school. Uh, so, but they grow, and so and they have re- in, the, in the in the course of the books. I mean, they grow, they have relationships, and uh, and then Joanne adopts uh, another child along the way, um, Taylor Shreve, who's Joanne's uh, Sally's birth child, and so so that child is becomes very dear to Joanne as well. There are secondary characters who recur in the series, and. They're like, I, they have worked for me like uh, characters in a repertory company. Sometimes they step forward and they have a very large part. And other times they're kind of, um, they just kind of recede into the background of Joanne's world. And, uh, but that has been really, uh, that has been a great boon because it means that I'm, as a writer, I'm coming to the manuscript with, uh, I have, I have my people, <laughs> you know, I've, I have a cast. And um, but as readers, they're familiar with these people. They want to know what's going on. Readers identify very, very strongly with that, especially with Joanne, who is uh, much nicer than I am. Um, they, they, she really is. She's, anyway, but um, uh, but she uh, it, it's it's interesting because there were two instances where she did something that they felt was uh, uncharacteristic. Um, and one was. She was, I, it was just me being bad writing. I was, I was tired in bearing Ariel. I still remember this. I was thinking I got to do something more than she said, he said, she said, you know, he said, so I'm going to do something else. So I had her saying, you know, Joanne, um, I don't know about that. Joanne said, sipping her martini. And then all of a sudden she was sipping more and more wine or whatever. So I was avoiding, I said, but I got many letters from people concerned about Joanne and her increased drinking pattern. So anyway, that was one thing. And the other was when Joanne meets the man she ultimately marries. I did get them married off because I heard so much static about this, but she meets a man and he is exactly what no one would have chosen for her. He's a, he's a, he's a, a, a paraplegic lawyer and he's a, and he's tough guy and he's, he is, because he's paraplegic, he always figured he wasn't going to last long. So he lives life like an 18-year-old with a death wish, as his doctor says. And anyway, and Joanne meets him. And right away, uh, they are they are so attracted to each other. And so I actually have just written a repeat, uh, just a repetition of this in the book I'm working on now. But where uh, they they know the first night, they, they I mean, they, they have known barely, not not even a week. And they, they both go to Joanne's and they're sort of necking and realizing that her kids are going to be coming back and, and that her high moral uh, standards will be kind of eroded if they see this. So he asks her, would you come over to my place after? And she says, yes. And then as she's getting ready, she thinks she's this will make bring to a grand total of four the number of sexual partners she's had in her life one was her husband and they were married 20 years and she was faithful and uh one was a guy who was more a friend one was alex k quarterway a man she really did love but their problems were quite irreconcilable uh, and and turned out to be irreconcilable and now this guy who she's known less than a week so anyway but that that too has been an interesting uh, and Zach was a good person to bring in. They're a good couple. They're, they, it's not an easy, it's not an easy marriage, but it's a good one. Uh, so th- that's something else that you know has I think worked well for me. Now, and this comes to the final question. A friend sent me an article. I, I'm always asked, "How are you going to end the series?" And fair enough question because um, because I'm 78 and it's not going to go on forever. And uh, no, I'm not going to go, I guess, I don't, although I hate to think of that. But, um, but a friend recently sent me an article 
about how writers who have characters that they are um, that they have created protagonists that have been long, worked in their series for a long time, how they end it. And because mostly, I think people really do get tired of their... I'm never tired of Joanne. She's always interesting to me. She's always got new stuff going on. But so far, we've been lucky. And But she, she in this article, they were pointing out that some sometimes... Um, People have just killed their characters off, and I—I I mean, I—if I, I could—I can tell you right now, that would never happen for me. I had—I had a letter many years ago. I had a letter from a woman as soon as Zach was on the picture on the on the scene, uh, a letter from a woman in Montreal who said, "If anything ever happens to Zach Shreve, I will never read another word you write again." So I think I had my fair warning there. And then there was, um, but Vi Warshawski said, and some other people. Uh, are content to let others take the series on after they die. And I don't want that with Joanne. Uh, V.I. Warshawski, who writes the, uh, writes the, uh, or sorry, Sarah Poretsky, who writes the V.I. Warshawski series. She uh, says, V.I. Warshawski, she's mine. I mean, she's, I am so much a part of her. I, I don't want somebody else taking that over and, and not knowing what to do with it. And, and I, I feel that way about Joanne. I also feel that I really want her to have a happy ending. I mean, I don't, I, you know, it's a, one of my favorite movies, corny as it was, was the original Little Women where Joe and Joe and Professor Bear go off and there's a rainbow and they have an umbrella over them. And I think, I mean, really, it is a little bit too much on the nose, but still, that's kind of what I want for Joanne. So um, I will, you know, I think, I mean, I'm, as I said, I'm, I have another book that will be published already. That's at the, we published September 2021. And I have another book that I'm working on now. I think I, I, the books have been very, very good to me. And I, I mean, they've given us a very interesting life in, in an area we would not normally have. And I like Joanne as a character and I like her way too much just to spin it out and, you know, just to keep selling books that I'm not interested in anymore. And you can, you can pick that up. I can, as a writer, I can tell when the, the writer has lost interest in the character and it's, it's not fair, you know, so at any rate, that is the question that those are my questions that I hope will answer you. And I would like to say one last thing, just to thank yet again, the Saskatchewan Library Association for doing this and really uh, showing their commitment to the readers in this province and to the writers. And uh, we are, I don't think sometimes we all realize as writers and, and readers how fortunate we are. We have such great support for writers here. And uh, and I, I am grateful. And uh, uh, yeah, and I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I've enjoyed doing it.